Well, welcome everyone to a virtual meetup with Queensland AI in partnership with the Queensland AI Hub. I'm Sue Kay and I've been on the advisory board of Queensland AI and am now a board director for the Queensland AI Hub. From now on, you'll often see our meetup events being promoted by the Queensland AI Hub uh, to help amplify our reach and to generally promote Queensland AI meetups and the Queensland AI community more broadly. So the formation of the Queensland AI Hub was announced by Minister Kate Jones in early May, and the Hub represents an investment by the Queensland Government of $5.5 million over the next four years. The aim of the Hub is to build Queensland's AI community and support the broader AI industry in Queensland. Um, so although the Hub has only recently been announced, it really has had quite a long gestation period beginning with the formation of the Queensland AI Meetup Group many years ago. So hopefully we will continue to see the Queensland AI community grow and get stronger in the years to come. And now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Phil Valencia. Phil and I work together at CSIRO's Data61 as part of the Cyber Physical Systems Research Program. Phil is our go-to person for anything related to embedded intelligence. When I asked Phil whether he would present Queensland AI, he suggested that his topic of choice would be tiny ML and that he's looking to build a community of tiny ML enthusiasts. So I thought that this would be a great match between speaker and audience. If you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A section of the Zoom meeting or uh, also you can use the chat and we will get to those questions at the end of Phil's presentation. So TinyML looks at how you can apply machine learning to perform on-device analytics of sensor data at extremely low power. To find out more, let's hear from Phil on advances in microcontrollers and machine learning. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Sue. And uh, I want a special shout out to you to, to thank you for uh, so promptly arranging that to be able to uh, get me to uh, speak at, the, at this, with this opportunity. Um, and also, I just want to say thanks to uh, the team, my team, uh, including uh, my boss, Brano, uh, who allowed me to get some uh, material from the team and pull this together. All right, so I guess, um, uh, as Sue has alluded to there, um, uh, the topic is, is tiny ML, um, which is a, it, it is actually a whole community um, in itself, but it actually comes back to uh, machine learning running on microcontrollers. And what I wanted to do today was run through, um, uh, I guess, the advances that have been happening on microcontrollers uh, and machine learning uh, to really uh, enable this uh, sort of future that we're, we're seeing unfold before us. Okay, so what are microcontrollers? Well, they're, they're, they're often, you know, shorthanded to MCUs or microcontroller units. They are cheap. Um, you can see one there in the middle of the screen. That's one of our uh, go-to microcontrollers, the Nordic chip. Um, they're small. They, <clears throat> excuse me, they, uh, they're fairly general purpose. So, you know, they can be programmed uh, to do many different things. Um, they're, they're low power. Uh, that's a very critical part of their advantages. They have a reduced instruction set. So they're not as sort of feature rich as your CPUs and GPUs in terms of the, the commands that they can do. Um, but uh, they, they're very efficient at doing that. They, uh, they, <clears throat> sorry, now they are much uh, slower than CPUs. So you, you really are orders of magnitude uh, different from the CPU class that you see inside your desktop machines. Uh, they're very limited in memory. Um, so they, they have to, they have very limited RAM and their program space, they don't normally have that much external sort of space for their sort of programs. Normally that's, that's also on board the chip as well in the ROM. And, and that's quite limited as well. And, and those two things are probably the biggest sort of challenge for uh, machine learning actually with uh, microcontrollers. They are very uh, rich in IO typically. So they, they often have buses that allow them to connect to other peripherals. So they're very geared up for sensing um, with other sensors and things like that. Okay, so what's the fuss about these microcontrollers? Well, 250 billion of them are out there at the moment. Um, there's about a trend of uh, about 30 billion uh, every year happening, uh, being shipped every year. 
they're increasingly becoming connected. So they're being connected via Bluetooth to people's phones or Wi-Fi to people's home Wi-Fi's. Uh, and also the, the long range, uh, low power WAN networks, such as your NB-IoT, um, LoRaWAN and, and other technologies. Now these things enable many qualities of life. And, and I've said this to so many people, you know, it's, it, it sort of wears off on me. And, you know, you know I, I throw away a few things and say, oh, it's in this and it's in that. What I did this morning though, was is I woke up and I sort of said, you know what, I'm gonna sort of count how many microcontrollers I, I come past just in my daily routine. So first up, we've got, uh, you know, hygiene. So both these things have microcontrollers in them to, to do timings and control different sort of things. Um, you've got your, your health trackers, your kids got Fitbits, I've got an Apple watch, they've got microcontrollers in them. You can, you know, microcontrollers to motivate you, you know, to slash deliver bad news in the morning, which motivates you then to try to do something about that. Um, so, you, you know, you've got this microcontroller in there for you managing different speeds and all that sort of stuff. Of course, you're gonna need some clothes, so you want them washed and dried. Um, you know, the, this, this, this um, uh, washing machine of mine there is, is, whoop, sorry about that, is what is connected into, uh, you know, my Wi-Fi and tells me all sorts of things about when things are ready. Uh, even an iron, uh, you know, to iron your clothes um, has these microcontrollers. You want your toast, your coffee, and your, your food nice and cold, uh, cooking, your microwave, you know, everything. Like, you know, the, the, obviously you have to clean up after, play some games, you know, all these things here, while, uh, got these little microcontrollers in them. Smart TVs are a, a classic these days, all being shipped with, with microcontrollers and connecting to the internet. Same with speakers, um, you know, now we've got smart speakers. There's a whole you know, ecosystem now being built around these uh, microcontroller devices. Um, even like smart lights here in my, my daughter's room you can have all sorts of fun by telling, uh, by telling um, uh, you know, Google to change all the colors, which is all fun. Um, you know, just uh, air conditioners, have had them for many years, your headphones, and you know, even just smart chargers, like um, you know, there's negotiations uh, with devices, and that's before you get out the door. Of course, you know, just you need a microcontroller in your your car keys, and your car. Well, your average car has more than 50 microcontrollers in it. So you know, you know, I had I, I had a count of over 50. I sort of lost count before I got out the door of microcontrollers I counted in my everyday encounter in my house. Then add on an extra 50 just by hitting hitting the car. You get to work, your PC accessories, keyboards, mice, printers, screens, etc. all these things. And uh, I might say I'm probably a little bit above average on the microcontroller, uh, uh, how many I have. So, uh, yeah, so essentially microcontrollers are everywhere. So, uh, you know, what, what, what is it that's sort of helped them sort of proliferate so much? Well, one of the big sort of like things that we've sort of noticed over the last decade is, is that the speed that uh, they can run instructions and, and, and do sort of computation has grown uh, you know, sort of exponentially over the years. So like they're 30, 30 times faster, but yet they're eight times less power consuming for that 30 times faster. They offer richer instruction sets than these original really cut down instruction sets. The radios now on these things are, uh, are eight times faster and also 30 times less power but get 10 times the range. So, you know, it's, it's really affording all these new applications because of the confluence of these um, massive um, energy savings as well as computational capabilities and bandwidth capabilities. And uh, batteries uh, have also improved. Um, you know, a lot of things have shifted to the lithium ions um, because they have a really dense and lightweight sort of uh, characteristic. That's also enabled a lot of IoT devices. And of course, just many advances in sensors. They're, they're ever, ever getting um, more sophisticated and lower power. And um, it's not unreasonable now to expect a, a accelerometer to sample at 50 Hertz at less than a microamp now. So what are the drivers though of TinyML? Um, so energy is probably one of, the, one of the big ones. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, look, machine learning, surely that's gotta be using some energy. And then it does, but then you have to weigh off you know, what, what are you saving? And it's really, it really comes back largely to the transmit trade-off, the compute transmit trade-off. 
So you can afford to do a lot of computation, um, many millions of instructions per one transmit of a packet, um, nearly regardless of what protocol it is. And but there are you know, lower power ones these days like Bluetooth, even Bluetooth. If you were to stream off say the accelerometer data, you'd be easily looking at sort of like 15 milliwatt average. Uh, whereas if you were doing something like, like, like we do, where you, um, you run some uh, machine learning on the device and then stream off classification information, um, you're able to have that average down to uh, a milliwatt or less. And, and so these, that, that's, a, that's a big enabler because what that does in, the, in terms of that re energy reduction, it actually allows you to increase the lifetime that opens up a lot of different applications and utilities. Um, it allows you to make the batteries smaller that allows you to keep the size of the device down and that in turn also drives the cost down as well. So those, all, all those sorts of drivers um, are really enabled by, by the energy um, savings. Some other, some other drivers are the fact that, um, you know, bandwidth availability, uh, you know, so spectrum use and um, also just the cost of transmitting. So if you're using one of the you know, narrowband IoT or you know, telco sort of uh, back end solutions, then um, you, you just want to reduce the amount of data that you're actually sending. Um, privacy and security is, is not an obvious one, but it's, it, it, it actually means that you don't have to have all of this raw data being pushed up to say the cloud where it can actually be used for different purposes than its original intent. So by um, actually having um, uh, classification of exactly what you want, um, that sort of information coming off, um, it can't be sort of re-engineered or reused for, for different things. So you actually do get a bit more privacy there for that. And also you can have things that don't even send to the cloud. They just actually send um, directly back to the, to the user. So you don't, you, you know, you can make decisions or send, tell you information about yourself uh, around health or whatever, without the need of actually pushing that to the cloud to calculate it. It can just be told um, directly. Uh, that sort of ties into the real timeliness. Um, you know, it, it, you know, having that decision making on the device allows you to send some sort of action or message in real time and, and close the loop on um, some sort of decision making. So if your heart rate's too high or something like that, you can do a real time uh, local alert to sort of say, hey, look, you probably need to ease off and, um, or something like that. The other thing um, that uh, we've definitely uh, seen as a motivation is the fact that you just can't rely on internet connections always being there. Um, we do lots of deployments in, in, in a lot of remote places and, and even places that you don't class as remote, like in the metro CBDs, but in areas like construction site, sites where just the, the ability to have a robust sort of internet connection, whether it be through cellular or through Wi-Fi or whatever, just isn't really available. So you don't really want to be dependent on having to have that internet connection always available for it to make sort of intelligent decisions. Um, flexibility and modularity and scalability, that, that sort of comes back to the fact that, you know, when you, when you have um, these, that machine learning running on the devices, it enables you to have these sort of smaller bespoke units, um, you know, concentrating on, on a specific task and, and it makes an ecosystem rather than having to have something heavy, big and heavy, like your phone or something like that to always have to, to send that information back to the cloud. Context awareness is something I'll probably get into a little bit later. Um, and uh, I guess just sort of reiterating that this has really enabled a lot of innovative um, applications that just wouldn't have been possible without uh, microcontrollers. Um, and, you know, many of the things that I've sort of talked about just in my daily sort of start there, uh, you know, are some examples of that. Uh, but there are obviously many other really cool examples. Uh, the other thing is, is that it does also um, ease the um, storage and processing and comms to the cloud pane. So um, I talked a bit about the comms reduction there, but, but it can also be like um, you know, a massive storage problem. So video and audio uh, type of data um, having to be always shipped up to the cloud is uh, there's a lot, that's a lot of data to, to be streaming constantly and then doing all your decision making back there. So if you're able to um, classify, say what's in the video, uh, rather than sending the video, you're talking um, many thousands of times sort of reduction in the, in the bandwidth there and the storage load. Okay, so seriously, we wanna do machine learning on microcontrollers. Um, you know, it sounds like a, a pretty big challenge given all of the you know, energy and memory constraints and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, if you, if you look at 
places that are already achieving uh, machine learning. So you've got your desktop machine, CPUs, you've got your GPUs, which obviously are uh, being highly utilized these days for speeding up machine learning. You can have your, your FPGAs and your ASICs for really bespoke solutions where you, you know exactly what you're doing. You, you're not likely to be upgrading uh, sort of the functionality or changing the model or the neural network or whatever. Um, uh, but they're, they're actually very um, hard to, 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 to deal with, right? So they're not really flexible uh, like a, a microcontroller or a CPU in terms of being able to um, you know, re, retask it with a new, say, model that easily. Um, so it sort of sits over in this bit of a weird corner, but it is motivated by all of those sorts of um, applications and stuff like that I discussed before. So to start progressing machine learning on on these uh, this on microcontrollers, we've um, th there's a few there's a few different tacks you can you can do. You can you can do all of the learning and stuff like that in the in the cloud, <clears throat> and then just do the inferencing on the device. And that obviously is definitely a recommended approach. Um, because that training part is, is, is very um, computationally expensive. You can distribute the model um, over different layers. So you can have the devices and edge devices are like your powered, uh, say your, your Google Home things and, and things like that. Um, and then you've got your, your cloud as well. And uh, so you can, you can actually sort of say, you know, some parts you know, we, might, we might compute on the device, um, other aspects uh, we might compute at the edge or the cloud. So you might calculate some features and things like that on the device and do some machine learning at the edge or at the cloud. Um, an obvious one is just to improve the efficiency of the algorithms, um, also the efficiency of the hardware and the software architectures that you're running those algorithms on. Uh, and the final one, which is sort of, I guess, what we, we spend a fair bit of time on is, is designing new algorithms um, where we've already considered the resource constraints of microcontrollers. Uh, I guess not any one of these in, in itself is really a, a golden you know, ticket to, to have success. You really have to use a, a few of these to, to really achieve machine learning on microcontrollers. So, um, alluded to there, the hardware and the software sort of acceleration. So in neural compute um, uh, units, uh, for processing units, uh, are now starting to uh, make their way onto microcontrollers. Um, they're still just as small and, and very low power, but they're designed specifically for those instructions around matrix multiplications um, that uh, are needed by neural networks and other um, shallow classifiers. And just as an example, the, the ethos, um, chipset their um, arm claim a 90% energy reduction over the current Cortex um, MS, uh, chipset for AI applications. Um, on the um, architecture side, um, uh, ARM have also been very um, forthright in, in exploiting their um, SIMD instruction set um, for accelerating neural network type applications or, and also machine learning. And that sort of ballpark uh, allows you to get a five times improvement just by simply um, utilizing these libraries that have been really bespokely customized for, for those instructions uh, to exploit the, the instructions on the microcontrollers. Um, so uh, other than that, then you can start looking at the model optimization. So um, there are lots of uh, opportunities there for improving the models. Uh, you can you know, do pruning or sparsifying the model, um, you know, that can help with memory footprints and computational time. Um, you know, you can distribute computations over the network, um, you know, integerize and, and avoid sort of floating point as much as possible or, you know, where it has uh, fixed, uh, or fixed or floating point accelerations, you know, to make sure that you use those, um, uh, those instructions. Um, you can try to avoid, I guess, the really more, you know, I guess, choosing your models such that you're not using, say, second order um, uh, optimization methods, which uh, are much harder to compute, you know. Um, so you can sort of, I guess, trade off uh, perhaps some of the richness or, or complexity of the models uh, for more simple, simple uh, kernels and models, uh, and that will, that will definitely help. Um, and, uh, and yes, and just sort of optimizing your data structures, just being very cognizant of 
the memory that you're working within the um, the bus sizes and things like that uh, you know uh, you know the, uh, the integer sizes and things like that so that you're sort of really keeping things to to multiples of powers of two and things like that so uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of thinking has actually been done around this for TensorFlow so TensorFlow Lite is uh, sort of Google's um, uh, effort towards bundling um, the sort of smaller version of, of TensorFlow. So still achieving the, the TensorFlow capabilities that your desktop and, and cloud stuff uh, uh, do. So allow those models to be uh, cut down and, and simplified and sort of made more efficient uh, so that they can run on your mobile class devices. And so um, they've had a lot of success with pushing this onto sort of Android and, and iOS devices. And, and demonstrating that those complex models can actually be run on your sort of phone class um, and, and also like uh, your Raspberry Pi type class devices. So that's, that's been really successful, but um, for the microcontroller classes, it's, it's yet another step uh, required there because it really is a really reduced um, uh, platform in terms of what, what RAM and ROM is really available compared to say even your phone. Um, and so, um, the TensorFlow Lite micro team um, uh, uh, have a, uh, a special group um, that actually met this morning at 1 a.m., which I luckily was there <laughs> while I was writing this. Um, and, you know, you can see them working with ARM uh, around really trying to optimize those libraries so that they can, um, you know, get those efficiencies and, and demonstrate those sort of more complex um, models uh you know tensorflow models running on on these really constrained micro platforms um, just as an example down that previous slide there um you know one of the things that they have is like uh, speech keyword detection like the hot word detection and that model is only 22 kilobytes in size which which i think is quite impressive um okay so the it, having these sorts of uh, deep learning and shallow classifiers being able to run on microcontrollers um, offers a lot of opportunities. So a lot of the ones I talked about this morning on my, my startup, a lot of those aren't yet really exploiting machine learning. However, um, there are plenty of opportunities in those spaces um, for, for you know, utilizing machine learning and more complex uh, inferencing logic to, to get value. And these are some of these areas and we've, we've been playing in many of these. Um, distributed sensing systems is the um, umbrella group that my embedded intelligence team uh, sits within. And um, I guess just over the last uh, sort of 15 years, we've evolved from a wireless sensor network group where we were doing a lot of environmental sensing through to trying to use microcontrollers to close loops um, and have some more intelligence around sort of real-time decision making. So we, we did the virtual fencing stuff, which is now um, uh, Adjison's, uh, you know, exploiting that license. And, uh, you know, and, and that was, I guess, our first sort of uh, demonstration of being able to use microcontrollers low power enough to be able to run sort of indefinitely in, in the field. Uh, back then, we still needed pretty clungy uh, batteries and things like that to enable it to happen. But these days, I, um, I'll talk about the fact that we can do it much more efficiently. Um, we've also done a lot of stuff towards wildlife monitoring and animal monitoring, uh, both physiological sensing as well as behavioral sensing and location tracking. Uh, and I guess um, off the back of that, we really started then um, looking more deeply at more complex sort of behaviors rather than just activity classification, um, but looking at sort of uh, complex uh, things like how, you know, much uh, intake is this particular cow, you know, eating, um, you know, what behavior is it currently doing? And, and, and some other things which uh, we'll which probably save off for another time around um, compliance and things. These are some of the platforms, um, just a couple of the platforms are there on the right there, and they sort of feed up to um, sort of complex backends, which um, allow you to do machine learning in the cloud as well, based on that data uh, for say yield estimation or you know spread of disease or animals and, and things like that. So there's a whole you know within our group of distributed sensing systems, we do everything right from the devices and the embedded logic, the platforms right up to the um, backend uh, data storage and analysis. That's just a, 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 I always like showing the virtual fencing stuff because it's that's one of those applications that really is just could only be enabled by 
by uh, microcontrollers uh, running in real time out on the field. You can't rely on internet connection out there. You need to make those decisions quickly so the animals get the right associations. Um, there's an example of our, our bats. We, we, I think we nearly had about 100 bats uh, tracked and you know, they were 20 grams housed for those devices. Um, again, this is what those sort of onboard decision making and classification affords. You know, we were able to save a lot of energy by detecting when the animals were not flying, when the bats were not flying. And because of that, it meant that they were able to recharge during the day when they were roosting. And then that afforded us to do one hertz GPS tracking. So every second to work out where that bat is flying um, and to see sort of unprecedented sort of information around what bats are up to. Um, nope. And, you know, and here's an example of a trace for, for that particular period of time there of one, one bat. And you can see you know, the, the richness of information that this stuff can afford you. Now, some of the bigger challenges um, Australia has is, is around um, biodiversity and um, say the coral reef monitoring. And so we've got a, a, a big initiative there where we're looking at um, censoring uh, animals and censoring reef and uh, uh, and also sort of, yeah, I guess, classifying what's actually happening down at the bottom of the, um, on the reef. Um, through that, you know, these are some of the, some of the projects that are happening within that. Um, we're able to do um, fish uh, feeding detection. We have star, starfish uh, classification um, and different, and we're looking also at um, sort of seagrass and biomass and things like that that's, you know, now I'm happening. Oh, that's the insertion of a, uh, of uh, tracking biosensory implant, so that's doing some physiological sensing. From that, we're able to look at the ECG trace and determine uh, when the animal's feeding by looking at the change of uh, bio biometrics of the um, heart rate and things. Um, the starfish detection, um, this didn't work. Yeah. Um, so what you're seeing there is, is the real-time detection of um, uh, starfish. Uh, so the idea here is, is that we will have these little surfboards uh, behind trailing behind a, a boat and we'll be able to scan a sweep through these massive areas and get sort of unprecedented coverage of really where all of these um, crown of thorns are and starfish are. <laughs> um, this is just a, another thing which is just sort of alluding to the fact that we have the ability to be able to Sort of uniquely label each one as we see it and, and therefore get a, a good accurate count. So this is video based machine um, you know learn, learning classification uh, not just sort of like frame frame classification. Right um, so eGrazer is, is a project that's that's been quite a long time in, in the making. Um, this is uh, going back I wouldn't say 10 years, but it's going back quite a, quite a, many, quite a few years. Um, and that was sort of like our first uh, foray into that rich sensor data of accelerometers that you can get uh, for quite low power. And then, you know, what can you do with that? And, you know, the, the, the initial goal, you know, was to sort of say, well, look, let's, um, uh, let's try to classify various behaviours. But the stretch goal was like, can we actually work out how much the animal's eating? Because that's really what the farmers want to know. Um, and so, uh, you know, my researchers have been looking at that and they've achieved some, you know, impressive outcomes there with, with on-device classification, over 90% accuracy uh, of being able to detect, uh, I think, six or so different sort of behaviours and activities um, and, and actually being able to, um, you know, uh, classify uh, bite detection of when the animals are biting based on, an, uh, based on a collar at the moment. But um, we are now in the process of... Uh, of making it into um, uh, an algorithm for the ear tag. Um, uh, speaking of ear tags, uh, this is a great uh, example of a platform. The series tag is a platform we've made. Again, exploits a microcontroller. It's very bandwidth constrained. It, do it, it doesn't have continuous access with the Bluetooth gateway. It needs to use direct satellite comms. Uh, and so that bandwidth is extremely constrained. Uh, and so therefore you really want to do as much smarts as possible to maximize that very limited bandwidth that you have. Um, and so, um, yeah, that, that's, uh, keep an eye out for, for series tag um, to see what they uh, do with that platform. Um, I guess one of the concepts, so now we're sort of, I guess, drifting into a little bit um, of what we're moving towards right now. Um, 
And that's the idea of, of sort of using uh, classifiers, uh, say, you know, vision-based ones to actually help us uh, make other classifiers uh, that are from, from, say, accelerometer data on animal. Um, that's, uh, uh, it's a difficult problem for, for, for many different reasons, but um, this is a, a very recent trial where um, this is exactly what we're doing is, I'll just fast forward that a little bit because I can see some animals. Um, you can actually see here, we've got these, these animals uh, coming up, um, you know, they're grazing away, um, they're drinking, and we're using the vision-based system here to classify, you know, which animals are drinking and eating and, and, and when. Uh, and then the ear tag data, you've got the, the, the collars on there are running that e-grazer algorithm that I was mentioning, classifying different behaviors and also recording all the raw accelerometer data. Those collars are great in the sense that they allow us to do like year long raw data dumps of like continuous GPS traces and, and accelerometer traces and stuff like that. But the ear tags is really obviously the future of where, um, uh, you know, this sort of stuff is going to go. And, and so therefore we're able to use this sort of a, uh, an experiment to be able to generate data to, to train that. Another cool thing happening within our team is this idea of batteryless machine learning. Um, so this is um, uh, one of our researchers is really pioneering this area around using energy harvesting to uh, gain enough energy uh, uh, and use the energy that's coming in uh, as the actual source of data. So rather than using accelerometer for, for classifying, what you do is you actually use the, the, the frequency of, of how the, the energy being harvested changes, and that becomes your sensor data input. And impressively, um, she's been able to demonstrate this batteryless uh, uh, system whereby it, uh, it harnesses the energy from vibration. So you, you can you close this case up, you can dump it into some you know, truck or something like that, as it vibrates around, it'll tell you, you know, it'll, it'll be able to harness enough energy to be able to do classification. And uh, that classification might be, say, for um, looking at, say, human behaviors if it's attached to a human, or it might be looking at, say, modes of transport if it's being attached to some sort of um, asset or something like that. Uh, the next step for that is to really integrate multiple uh, modalities of energy harvesting. So not just your, your vibration, but also looking at your solar and your say thermal energy um, and integrating those together. And that becomes now more sources of sensor data in a way that you can use to classify more complex, um, more complex outcomes. I realize I'm starting to run over time, but I just do want to try to get through these last few bits. Um, I just wanted to talk about the fact that um, we've spent a considerable amount of um, time lately um, pushing on the, the Bluetooth, which has been a real enabler for, um, uh, for comms, uh, we've have a, we have a nice um, hybrid solution where we have um, Bluetooth and LoRaWAN uh, for LoRaWAN for so for for low bandwidth backhaul, but the um, but the the device itself is capable of of computing um, in situ uh, a lot of information. So it can actually work out where it is based on talking to other devices in the area, um, and it's capable of doing um, classification of of different um, sort of um, um, events. Um, and so, yeah, this is all really, the focus is around the node itself or the device itself being able to do this, um, uh, the, this sort of complex reasoning and things, uh, and then being able to share that out to provide sort of context and information for other things that are around it. So you can imagine like a, a, a forklift and a gas bottle and a, and a worker, you know, are all in an area and each of the devices that's, that's attached to each of those things are uh, transmitting to each other and informing each other around where they are, what their state is, and that state is provided really by the machine learning uh, on, 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 the, on the microcontroller. Uh, this is just talking about the localization capabilities that we have with just the Bluetooth localization that the device is doing. So as I said, the device itself knows where it is. Um, and we were use, we've, able, we've been sort of using, able to demonstrate this system um, for, you know, supply train tracking um, and, uh, yeah, and sort of safety demos as well around using sort of regulation technology. Um, this is just a brief um, uh, example of 
looking through a HoloLens at our sort of devices um, and you can sort of interact with them and, and sort of see what their current status is and, and, and yeah, what they're up to. I'll just quickly skip past that. Um, I just wanted to finish, I guess, with the, the future of where we're heading right now, which is around sort of uh, autonomous biodiversity and, um, and also um, uh, closing the loop. So, you know, here's an image that's come from a camera trap. We've fed it through our classifier. Um, you know, it feeds it off via 4G in this particular case and it's, and it's got it. So you may not even seen it if you weren't really looking for it. And that's one of the advantages around the system is, is that, you know, they're able to continuously sort of monitor uh, and they don't get tired like humans do. Now, the disadvantage with this system is that it really um, is reliant on the camera trap to try to trigger and detect based on its PIR sensor. Now, that's not always going to be reliable for detecting different types of animals at, at different distances away. And so that's a, it's a good motivation for, for us to be able to do in situ classification and sending back just that event information, which is what we're doing. This was a previous one we did in the Amazon. Which, uh, which demonstrated sort of that concept on a Raspberry Pi, you know, classifying different, um, you know, um, animals uh, on, on a Pi class device. We're now sort of shifting that towards um, the, um, one of these types of devices here. I don't know if you can see me or not, but one of those uh, uh, SparkFind sort of edge uh, devices, which allow you to have that little camera and do machine learning on it with say TensorFlow Lite Micro. Um, there's a cool image there from the Amazon there of, of the type of data that we'd expect. So this is a thermal uh, data, um, very you know, low res. This is what you can afford on a, on a microcontroller class device in terms of energy. If you want something to last for a very long time or run indefinitely off solar. Um, I don't have the time or the patience to sit, sit through this, but if uh, you just have to believe me that there's a, there is actually a caiman or a crocodile type of thing, but it's caiman. Um, uh, and there's a possum up in this tree and, uh, it has a bit of a go at it, but the possum lived for, for the day. I just so it's a happy ending. And the final thing is this detect and deter. So um, you know, again, like here's an image. You know, if you're not really paying attention, there's a pig at the back there. So there's these feral animals that cause trouble. You know, they predate on turtle nests and they cause troubles with farmers and things like that. What we're looking to do is to try to solve the challenge of um, uh, you know de detecting these things reporting on them in real time, deterring them and having, you know, an evolutionary approach to, to be able to change the deterrent to, to be able to make sure that we really uh, can sort of keep the animals at bay. And that's probably going to involve humans in the loop and where the intelligence is going to have to be there is in the system learning in situ um, about what works and what doesn't in terms of deterring, how often does it need to, to bring in the human and how can we sort of reduce the rate of which humans have to come in to reinforce, um, you know, the, the right responses in, in, in the animals. So uh, very exciting stuff. Um, and, uh, and that's, yeah, I guess that's a bit of a summary of where we're at with um, the embedded uh, machine learning. Thanks very much, Phil. Uh, so we have got some questions from your audience. You've covered a, a wide range of material there, but thanks for, for giving us such a, a great overview. Um, so there is a comment from one of your colleagues. I think it's a comment rather than a question <laughs> on uh, microcontrollers being the ultimate case of a reconfigurable ASIC. I guess that goes back to your early slide where you're showing where microcontrollers fit in. I'm not sure if you have a comment on that. Yeah, look, um, I, I, yeah, there's some truth to that. Like, you know, it, it is a, you know, it is a very reconfigurable system. Uh, but, you know, ASICs uh, potentially still have their place um, where, you know, if you really aren't going to be changing, um, say, you know, the model or, or sort of the basic engine of, of how, it, how it's working, uh, an ASIC will will allow you to be able to get like even lower power than a microcontroller potentially can. The disadvantage is, is that it's very expensive to, to make an ASIC and uh, you know, you're, you're very, it's not, it's not reconfigurable as, as they were saying. Yeah. Or is easily reconfigurable for sure. Okay. And then uh, we have some questions from Kelvin Ross. Um, where do FPGAs fit in compared to the neuroprocessing units you were describing? Yeah, so FPGAs are really uh, probably in order to magnitude more energy consumption than the neural processing um, units will give you bang for buck. 
um, because they are essentially an ASIC, but just shoved onto the same chip, uh, you know, under the same die and, and all that sort of stuff. So they can really, um, uh, you know, they're not reconfigurable. So the MPUs are not reconfigurable, um, unlike a FPGA, uh, but they, you know, you're talking, uh, yeah, you know, you're talking sub sort of, you know, milliwatts in terms of, uh, you know, processing power to, to do sort of similar computations that you would do on an FPGA most likely. Um, I guess FPGAs could still have their spot depending on the particular architecture. So if you've got a specific camera input that you might want to run some sort of filter or something like that over it, then an FPGA could be sort of custom designed to deal with a certain bandwidth of data and do some pre-filtering or feature extraction or something. All right, thanks, Phil. And yeah, just a reminder to everyone who is on this webinar, if you would, if you have a question for Phil, just please add it to the chat or to the Q&A and um, he should be able to have some time to, to answer it. Um, another question from Kelvin Ross is, what does the ML workflow and deployment model look like for training, validation and deployment cycles? That's a good question. Um, you know, so uh, pipelines have been um, something that, you know, where, you know, we haven't really streamlined to date. And I think, you know, there's companies, many companies uh, have started putting a lot of effort into streamlining those processes. Um, at the moment, we sort of work on the fringe of, of sort of novel machine learning architectures. So sometimes those pipelines aren't as, uh, ready or, or useful for us um, because we're not really like a, a business where, where we're constantly getting a data stream where we're optimizing um, uh, a model to try to improve that and, and, and sort of then and push back out models. We're, we're probably more looking at challenges and that haven't really been addressed and, and, and not, there isn't really even an existing model that works and looking at different machine learning approaches to actually even make a, a first cut of that reality. But, uh, but certainly um, there's a lot of benefit in having a good pipeline where you can, you know, you can, you can change parameters, you can test different sort of parameter sweeps and things like that, and then get them more crunched. Um, so, you know, yeah, it's like, I mean, in, in, our, in our situation where we're doing fairly novel stuff, honestly, collecting the data is probably about 60% of the challenge. <laughs> Um, you know, getting to that point of being able to have, you know, low power microcontroller devices that are sampling all the sensors and all that sort of stuff in order to, to you know, on animals and, 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 and then annotate it and all that sort of stuff. A lot of time is, is spent on getting that data. Then, you know, I'd say, you know, that's probably like 60%. And then you've probably got like 40% of the time is really saying which features, what model is going to even work in this scenario that's going to be applicable or runnable on a microcontroller. And then like maybe 10% of that is then you're refining and, and parameter sweeping and doing your normal pipeline type stuff, uh, validations and things like that. So that's probably the real, uh, it's probably more realistic breakdown of the effort. All right, thanks, Phil. Um, so you've, you've painted a, a picture of how microcontrollers are everywhere, but you know, until recently, um, you know, I, it hasn't been quite the right conditions for applying machine learning. And so a lot of our machine learning communities have uh, really been operating uh, without thinking about how that can be applied to embedded, um, uh, well, you know, to apply to devices like microcontrollers. Where, uh, you know, when did you start looking at applying machine learning? I think we saw the promise of machine learning um, uh, right back uh, when we were doing the first um, uh, e-grazer stuff. Like even even coming back to um, you know to the virtual fencing stuff, which was like ten years ten years ago. Um, even there, we were looking you know or ten years plus probably. Um, we were th we we could see the benefit of being able to have models that could adapt to individual animals and um, you know. Yeah, could yeah could adapt in the field some sort of in, more intelligent behaviour, and it became very you know like you know increasingly clear that um, around that same sort of time that very simple behaviours like you know am I moving or not or whatever like that that sort of stuff we could send fairly easily some sort of periodic report on that but in order to have any sort of higher level information around you know is the cow ruminating or grazing or, or biting. Um, you know, 
you, you, you quickly run out of standard uh, statistical mechanisms and, and, and things like that, um, signal processing, which can give you reliable outcomes for those complex behaviours. And so I'd say about 10 years ago, we really started seeing the writing on the wall or you know, the limits of, of signal processing for that sort of classification. And then from, from then on, we've, we've been gradually sort of trying to shift ourselves across to you know, shallow classifiers and now more recently towards um, deep, deep classifiers as well as they become uh, affordable in terms of the energy consumption. Yeah. And, that, and that'll just allow more complex stuff to be done. Yeah, isn't it interesting? I mean, you know, because I, I know one of the things that's very frustrating is when, you know, people say, didn't you do cow tags like 20 years ago? And yes. it's a bit like saying, didn't we have mobile phones 20 years ago? As if yeah. nothing has it's changed, changed. Yeah, yeah. then and now. And um, and Heidi from Ceres Tag has um, put her contact details down for anyone who would like some more information about Ceres Tag. Um, well, we, we have a, and here's a tough one for you, Phil. Uh -huh. So uh, we have a question from Wei Yin Han. Um, who, uh, well, first he says, this is very interesting, Dr. Philip, thank you. Uh, and uh, Wei Yin is wondering whether any of the solutions that have been developed can easily be modified for COVID tracking and suggests <laughs> that it might be useful that instead of the current app on the phone, uh, you know, what about people who don't have a mobile phone? <laughs> so, um, yeah, look, I, I think that's a really tough question. So, Look, we are we are aware uh, of the, the the potential that our technology has for for that sort of application. Um, there are, are a massive uh, can of worms around um, privacy and, and things like that that have to be uh, sort of managed and and and, and uh, addressed, which are, to be honest, are actually much harder than the actual technology for achieving uh, like contract tracing. So I know, guess it doesn't matter whether it's on your mobile phone or on something else. It's the tracking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, that's the thing is like, we, 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 we use phones in our ecosystem of, of Bluetooth devices and stuff like that. And, and in a way it's just another IOT embedded device. It really, uh, it just has a little bit more, um, you know, power and, 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 and computational grunt and, and bandwidth. Um, you know, we, we, we are definitely able to do um, contact uh, tracing and detection with our technology. Um, but as I said, really, um, there are other processes around um, how do you go by, about, uh, you know, ensuring all the privacy and, and getting the processes in place for, you know, what to do, you know, how does a health official, whatever, get to your device and get your information off that tracking device or, or whatever. They're all the real challenges that, that that have to be thought through uh, to, to enable it. But um, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, it's not, uh, it's not gone unthought. We have definitely, definitely thought and, and, and around that particular topic. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. Um, we have another question from Robert L Ellen, who says, are you seeing ML workloads running alongside other workloads on the same device in the field or are these kept separate? And if they are co-located, does this present engineering challenges to meet all the requirements? Yeah, look, I mean, that's really, I guess, now at the sort of forefront of where we're heading into now. So we haven't really been running concurrent uh, classifiers to date. Um, that's something that I flagged with the, the, the TensorFlow Lite micro team. Um, they've assured me that the, the deep learning stuff is capable of being able to run concurrent models. But um, it's not something that they've uh, really tested and, and, and pushed on themselves. So that's a, it's an insightful question. Um, and, and it's something that we will be looking at really, you know, in, in depth uh, over the next uh, you know, coming year. Uh, because, you know, these classifiers do take a bit of time to crunch. And some classifiers and models will be, uh, you know, bigger and, and more meaty in terms of computational requirements. Uh, and how do you get them all to play nice on a microcontroller is a, is a good challenge. Yeah, well, Robert's follow-up question is, uh, are there any trends or opportunities for multiple devices with ML capabilities to cooperate on the same inferencing pipeline? So one device does initial layers, another does the subsequent layers. Yeah, yeah, well, definitely. There definitely is opportunities there. Um, that's, uh, I sort of skipped over it, but that is actually one of the mechanisms of trying to achieve a bit more... Um, uh, that, of that distributed approach, um, you know, 
you can you can do different levels of i mean we do this actually already you know we have an architecture where you you run machine learning on the device uh, and some reg tech rules on the device as well and then the output of those things then feeds up to another layer which then does more inferencing uh, and decision making uh, and um, you know it can happen at the edge and in the cloud as well so uh, that that is one way of doing it and that's a sort of like a hierarchical way of distributing that sort of machine learning there's also another means um, which I briefly touched on which is around the sort of the multimodal approach which can be that you can have multiple devices, uh, say on a person or, or in, a, in, an, in an area or something like that. And if they're sharing um, their machine learning state uh, or, or their state classifications and things like that or features with each other, then they are able to fuse that information and, and, um, and then make uh, more complex uh, reasoning there. So it means that you're sort of breaking it up. Um, you, know, you, know, you, you might have your, your smart watch and your smart shoe say, um, and you don't you don't need like the one watch or something to run all the machine learning. You can you can distribute you know some of the machine learning on the the shoe for doing pedometry or something. Then the watch can concentrate on the heart rate or something like that. And then um, you know either of them or some other third device can fuse that information to to infer some higher level thing like you're doing exercise because those two things are happening concurrently. All right, thanks, Phil. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of the talk, you showed us lots of examples around the home of uh, <laughs> yeah. where we all have uh, microcontrollers. Oh, sorry, there is another question. I'll leave mine for a little later. Um, there is a question on, can we implement deep learning models using the harvested energy from kinetic energy harvester leading towards autonomous devices? That's the hope. Um, and so at the moment, we've only done shallow classifiers, uh, but... Um, I don't see why it's not possible. I, I think, you know, I think it's definitely doable. Um, you know, you can do, you know, you know, that, that, you know, the amount of instructions that you can do on a microcontroller, you know, for, for a certain amount of energy is quite a lot. Um, as long as you've got some sort of, I guess, a fairly um, energy efficient feature extraction, there's, I don't think there's any reason why uh, deep learning can't be applied um, for, kinetic energy harvesting as well yeah great we're pretty sure they're working <laughs> <laughs> Not about Sarah. um so uh if members of queensland ai are keen to apply their skills to microcontrollers where do you recommend they start look i have to say um uh i'm a big fan of the the tensorflow light micro community um so i think this 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 slide deck is probably recorded so um, if you look back there, you can see the TensorFlow Lite um, uh, links. Um, but obviously, you can just Google it. You'll probably find it pretty quickly. Um, I would say make sure you look for TensorFlow Lite Micro. Um, that's, the, that's the community around the microcontrollers, not the sort of phone class devices. Um, they've got some very straightforward tutorials to get up and running um, using, say, the SparkFun kits and some other um, hardware. And, um, yeah, it's very... Um, even Arduino stuff, actually, um, it's, it's very straightforward to get into it. So I was lucky enough to, to go to the last TensorFlow, like, uh, TensorFlow conference and did a few of the tutorials there with microcontrollers and stuff and, yeah, found it very straightforward. Um, so if there are, we're coming to the close of the Q&A, so please get your questions uh, on, online in the Q&A or in the chat if you would like to ask Phil a question before the close of this session. Um, so just following on from uh, your recommendation around TensorFlow Lite Micro, um, what do you think, uh, you know, is that the main area of support that already exists for tiny ML practitioners uh, in Australia or, uh, you know, is there a community? Oh, look, yeah, look, tiny ML is a community. So tinyml.org is, is the go-to sort of community for, for not just TensorFlow, but, you know, it's, it's looking, it, it, it's more inclusive. So, you know, includes all your shallow classifiers as well. Um, you know, uh, I, I, yeah, look, I, I'll just say tinyml.org would be a good, a good one to go for. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we have another question from one of your colleagues. Um, Google's uh, TensorFlow Lite um, vision is to have speech image classifiers embedded in everyday objects through small coin cell powered devices running deep machine learning models. Yep. How far do you think we are from this future? Oh, they already can do that. So, um, uh, the, the, if you go through their demo, right. So you can, you can be doing exactly that 
you know, you can be up and running doing that in about 15 minutes. <laughs> if you, if you follow like the, their tutorial and, and buy like one of those things for like, I think they're 25 bucks us or something spike on edge. Um, you can act, you know, they've got the microphones on there. They, you know, they've got a, a model where you can just, you know, you run through the process of training up the model and it does uh, yes, no, I can't remember a few, you know, four other things like six commands or something like that. So it's, 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 and it's running a, a, a deep, you know, it's running a TensorFlow um, deep learning network. Yeah. So there you go, Brano, the future is already here and you can <laughs> pick up on it in only 15 minutes. Um, so another question, is there currently any use case for supply chain tracking using the microcontroller ML and blockchain? And where can I learn more about this if there are? And I did not just, you know, um, I didn't make that question up myself. Okay. <laughs> this is from <laughs> Wei Yin Han again. So oh, excellent. Uh, there well, you go. It's a, it is a, it is a certainly something dear to me <laughs> because, uh, uh, I, I, I'm sort of overseeing a, a supply chain, um, project at the moment where we're really trying to, um, you know, leverage what microcontrollers can do in terms of classification of different, different things, like I've mentioned before with, with intake and behaviors of animals, but also um, uh, sort of leveraging that sort of localization and the, the ability for devices to be able to talk directly to each other. Um, that's really starting to afford this, this new opportunity of, of, of being able to generate trust, uh, you know, and uh, these are sort of, I think that's the next really big thing for supply chains is, is being able to have trust in the data that, that you're getting. So, you know, other things, sensing similar behaviors through different means and things like that. Um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's going to be a big area. So yeah, we've, we've got a fairly big initiative initiative towards a supply chain integrity and yeah, microcontrollers, uh, I, I, I the key fundamental first step of, of it all. Yeah. Yeah. And that integration with blockchain. Yeah. And I guess, you know, one of the other things that I know you spend a lot of time doing is, you know, working out how each of the sensors can police each other, you know, to make sure that you're not putting rubbish information on the blockchain as well. Exactly. Yeah. That comes back to that trust, right? So, you know, um, having that, uh, that, um, you know, multi-modality of sensing or, or of having different, like, you know, having different animals sensing, uh, you know, what other animals are sort of are, are nearby and, and up to and things like that uh, allows you to gain trust in a certain microcontroller to sort of say, is that, is that one a bit dodgy or, you know, is that sensor failing or is it GPS out of whack or something like that? Or is it, you know, machine learning model or whatever wrong? Um, you know, they can actually build up like reputations uh, of trust between each other. And so that's uh, active, active research right now. And we're, we're hoping by the end of the year, we'll have a, a really cool demonstration of all that. Oh, that's great. Phil, I knew you'd love that question. Um, <laughs> yeah, <I do. laughs> yeah. So we're almost out of time, but actually the second part of that question is, you know, uh, where would you recommend that people can learn more about that integration between, you know, microcontrollers, uh, machine learning and blockchain in particular? Um, yeah, look, one of my researchers has done um, uh, a fair bit around the edge IoT. So um, uh, Vulcan um, can, uh, if you if you look if you look if you follow that link actually on the research au slash dsss dss sorry, um, you'll be able to find sort of a, a page that links to our various projects. And so just look for sort of uh, edge uh, edge IoT or blockchain um, IoT and you'll be able to see uh, uh, the research that we're doing in that area. Yes, yeah, so Wei Yin Han, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, and I think we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much to Phil. Um, there's quite a number of thank yous to you on the chat. If you get a chance to open it up, um, Phil, I think everyone really enjoyed your presentation and uh, hopefully we'll get a lot more people um, from the machine learning side interested in how they can apply their, their knowledge to microcontrollers now. Sounds good. Looking forward to building, the, building that community. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Phil. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, look forward to seeing you at the next Queensland AI meetup.